Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I hope that you are all safe and well from wherever you're joining us this afternoon. And thank you so much for being here for what promises to be a very, very meaningful conversation. My name is Michelle Stevens. I'm a professor in the Department of Latino and Caribbean Studies and the Department of English at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. And I'm also the founding executive director of the newly established Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice. So funded through a major Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant, the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice is a scholarly endeavor that aims to span the university. It, aims to serve as a conduit for new knowledge and ideas, providing opportunities for Rutgers faculty, students, staff, graduate, undergraduate students, professional students, whose inquiries address racism and social inequality to work collaboratively in effect meaningful action and positive change. In bringing together scholars from multiple humanities disciplines, but also humanities inflected disciplines across Rutgers. So this would include from law to language, from philosophy to art, from history to gender studies, from politics to policy reform. The Institute serves as a university-wide intellectual corridor that escalates the likelihood that our explorations and findings will inform real world decisions, providing solutions to problems that have been increasingly thrust into sharp focus in the United United States and around the globe. So given this focus of the Institute, I cannot state strongly enough what a pleasure and an honor it is for me to be asked to play this role of welcome, welcoming all of us and of introducing the Louis G. Gambaccina, Gambaccini Civic Engagement Series Program on behalf of my colleagues at Rutgers University's Eagleton Institute of Politics. So first I'd like to say a little bit about this series as a framing context for our conversation today. Presented by Eagleton since 2012, the Louis J. Gambaccini Civic Engagement Series is designed to promote civic engagement by offering an annual discussion of timely and enduring issues of great significance with the objective of generating real civil discourse and action. Today's featured guest is an exemplar in this regard, described as someone who can, quote, inspire and catapult people into action, not just lip service, enabling them to build power and wealth for themselves and their community. The Gambaccini series was established through the generous support of Lou Gambaccini's family, friends, and colleagues to honor his outstanding legacy in public service and his lifelong dedication to upholding the highest standards of civic responsibility. His goal of always striving and inspiring others to leave communities better and more beautiful than they found them is an aspirational goal, certainly for my institute, a reality of the mission of the Eagleton Institute and of high value for Rutgers University at large as a state public university. Past speakers in the Gambaccini series include New York Times ethicist and NYU professor Kwame Anthony Appiah, Politico editor Carrie Budaf Brown, the iconic Congressman John Lewis, and US Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Before I introduce with great enthusiasm our featured speakers, I must pause on behalf of the Eagleton Institute to offer some words of appreciation for partners, co-sponsors, and collaborators in this event. We'd like to take a moment to specially thank first the Gambaccini family and the supporters of this series, many of whom are joining us out there now for making conversations like today possible. Eagleton would also like to thank Kimberly Peeler Allen, a visiting practitioner at the Institute Center for American Women and Politics for her help to make today a reality. Finally, I wanna recognize and thank the Institute's co-sponsors in presenting this afternoon's dialogue, including Rutgers Access Week, a program of the Division of Diversity, Inclusion and Community Engagement, the Rutgers Center for Social Justice Education and LGBTQ Communities, and the Paul Robeson Cultural Center. I wanna pause here on behalf of the Eagleton Institute and on behalf of my colleagues at the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice and speak in intentional solidarity with all of these colleagues among our co-sponsors, as well as the students of Alpha Phi Alpha, who are the victims of a series of despicable, racist, and homophobic Zoom bombing attacks last week, 
Echoing the words of Chancellor Malloy on Friday, we all stand with you and against hate. We will persevere in our efforts to work toward global racial justice. Now I'm thrilled to welcome the co-founder of the Black Voters Matters, Black Voters Matter Fund and Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute, Latasha Brown. Brown is an award-winning visionary thought leader, institution builder, cultural activist, and artist and connector. She's a nationally recognized go-to expert in Black voting rights and voter suppression, Black women's empowerment, and philanthropy. Brown is adamant about ensuring that all human beings have access to quality education, safety, security, peace, love, and happiness. She has raised millions of dollars to support social justice causes and created projects that bring more investments into marginalized communities. She's described her work as not rooted in strengthening political systems, governments, or institutions, but in the advancement of people. In recognition of her talent, expertise, and achievement, Brown has been featured on CNN, HBO, MSNBC, and Fox, to name a few. She is the recipient of the 2010 White House Champion of Change Award, the 2006 Spirit of Democracy Award, and the Lewis Burnham Award for Human Rights, as well as the 2018 Bridge Jubilee Award and Liberty Bell Award. Brown proudly serves as the founder of the Saving Ourselves Coalition, a community-led disaster relief organization that helped hundreds of families in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. She currently serves on the board of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, the Southern Documentary Fund, the US Human Rights Network, and the Congressional Progressive Caucus Center. Leading our conversation this afternoon is Marilyn D. Davis. Davis is a nationally recognized political strategist who previously served as the national director of community engagement at the Democratic National Committee, where she led a team responsible for engaging stakeholders in the African-American, Hispanic, AAPI, Jewish, LGBT, youth, women, ethnic, veterans, rural, organized labor, and small business communities in electoral politics and civic engagement. She served in the Obama-Biden administration as a political appointee at the US Department of Labor, where she worked under the leadership of Secretary Thomas E. Perez. In her current role as Area Director for Government Affairs for the fourth largest telecommunications company, Davis manages relations with elected officials and community partners and oversees legislative and regulatory matters. Before we jump into the program, I wanna encourage our audience members to put your questions in the Q&A box throughout the discussion for a special selection during the later half of the program. Ms. Brown, thank you so much for your virtual visit to the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers. I will now turn the program over to our moderator, Ms. Marilyn Davis. Hi, Michelle, thank you so much for that eloquent uh, introduction. And I am so honored today to one, be here with a fellow Southerner, um, also to be here with a fellow member of Win with Black Women. Um, it is my honor to be with my girlfriend in my head, Latasha Brown. Latasha, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy about being here today. And before I get into the questions, because I have a series of questions to ask you, because again, you're my best friend. I'm going to get all into your head. <laughs> um, I want to just turn the program over to you. Um, I know you have a surprise for the audience, so I'll let you take that. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for kind of the opportunity. Um, I like to get grounded as we start our conversations. Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. You know, I like to start before I do my talks with centering us in about what this is really about. 
that oftentimes we talk about politics, we talk about policy, we talk about laws and all of those things um, that impact our lives around governance. But what's most important is really that we center our humanity. And music has a way of literally centering us in the space of what this is really about. This is really about the advancement of humanity. And so given that, I wanna do a, just a short little exercise with you all, um, and then we'll go into the discussion. But I would like to have everybody, no matter where you are, of course, so a little bit about myself. I know they talked about um, some of the work that I've done, but I am a, a, a daughter of the deep, deep South. Um, I grew up in a Southern Baptist Christian um, tradition. And one of the things that we do is, you know, in order to feel like you're actually engaged, you have to feel engaged um, with your audience. And so we often do call and response or some kind of activity that people can participate, be participatory. So what I would like for us to do is no matter where you are, I'm going to ask you if you could just kind of get centered. If you could just kind of center your body, I want you to kind of see yourself as if you were a conduit that the sun was shining through your the top of your head and going all the way down to the floor, kind of get your feet grounded and just kind of get in position, kind of comfortable position. I'm also going to ask you, I know this is a talk and it's politics and you probably have all kinds of ideas and questions and, you know, thoughts happening right now. But what I'm going to ask you to do is just kind of clear your mind, just clear your mind. And if you would just... Um, um, humor me for a little while. What I would like for you to do is to just to close your eyes because I want to ask you a question. So with your mind clear, with your feeling very grounded, I want you to hear this question. What would America be without racism? What would America look like? What would be our systems, our institutions? our policy, our leadership. What would an America be without racism? Now take a deep breath in and just kind of release it. And then you can open your eyes. Now I can't see everybody who is participating in this but just for the show of those who are on camera right now, and there's not a right or wrong, there's not a people experience this question very differently. Um, and it's not, and it's, it's across the board, no matter who you are. Um, I want to ask just with the people that I'm looking at right now that who are on camera, um, how many of you were able to see something? How many of you had a really difficult time actually envisioning America without racism? Thank you so much. Thank you for participating. Um, the reason why I want to ask that question, I think it sets the tone, um, hopefully, you know, of, of the backdrop and the context for our discussion, Marilyn, today, is that, you know, I want you, the, the second thing I'm going to ask you all to do um, is just kind of look around you and some item that's near you, that's close to you, those of you that are still on camera, you know, do you have a, what's an item, like the closest item that you have? You can just kind of hold it up. Let me see it. Cell phone, I see a notebook, cell phones. Oh, a fist, ooh, I like that, Kia. <laughs> um, a pen, um, a remote control, um, all of those things. Um, thank you. All of those things, how were they created? How, what was the impetus of those things being created? The truth of the matter is that every single item that you all just showed me first had to be envisioned. Right before they were brought into the physical world, they had to be envisioned. And so I start with that in the context of if we are serious about creating a nation that is post of this, this post racial America, that a new, a nation that is void of racism, the first thing that we have to do is spend some time radically reimagining what that is and using the opportunity to envision. There is nothing that has been brought into the physical world. There's nothing that has been created in the physical being in the physical world that was not first envisioned. It may have started with a small idea, it may have went to a blueprint or a drawing, but in order for something to actually manifest in the physical world, it must come in the vision. The challenge, the reason why 
I wanted to ask that question is no matter where I go, whether I'm teaching at Harvard, whether I'm on a basketball court, when I ask that question, the majority of people have never thought about that question before. They've never been asked that question before. Matter of fact, up until my own using that question, I had never been asked that question before. And the significance of that is there is, it is virtually impossible for us to literally create a nation that is without racism if we have not even envisioned what it would look like. And so given that, I just wanted to do that exercise to really set the context of the work that I do that is centered around how I'm responding to what is in the moment, but also what is the responsibility for us to be visionaries, to really radically reimagine every single system that's in this country. So thank you, Marilyn, for giving me the opportunity to do that exercise. So I appreciate you and thank you all for participating. Wow, Tasha, that was amazing. One, let me say, I came from the labor movement. So the call and response between being in labor and being a Baptist is part of my, my, my identity. And, and I had never experienced it like this before. So I thank you for bringing it to the forefront. Um, but I, I, wanna, I wanna go back to something that Lachelle said in our Q&A. She, she, she highlighted the song you sang. And I want to just, that, that song touched me to my core because it took me back to Chapin, South Carolina, to that, the, the AME church was I was born and raised with those types of hymnals was part of the, the culture there. And, and I wanna go back to Selma, Alabama, where you're from, where you were born. Selma has such significance in our history and, and, and that those of us who are in this movement, we remember, or we've read about Bloody Sunday. We've, some of us have had the opportunity to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but, but I wanna, pose a question to you because I want to understand better my best friend what was it what was who was it that inspired you to pursue this walk who was it that that instilled in you that no way that you can make a way out of no way was actually possible so I pose that first question to you to get this party started okay. oh freedom oh freedom Whoa, freedom over me, over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. You know, I know this is not a concert. I know it was like, this is a talk, but this is what <laughs> I am a Southerner and this is how we do our talks, right? And so I wanted to start with the, you know, it started there that I am the descendant of a people who literally were brought here by force to a foreign land that oftentimes the only thing that we had was a song in our heart, right? That the only way that we could actually really be able to um, express um, our pain, our hopes, our desires, our fears was through song. The only way that we could communicate our desire to be free was through song. And so I say that because it's really interesting. This is the first time I've ever answered this question this way. But what has really come to me really strongly is that part of what has inspired this work is that it is always a song that was in my heart to want freedom that came from, a, from the hundreds of people I've been surrounded by in Selma. You know, I grew up and I wasn't born in Selma. I actually was born in New Jersey for me to be so Southern, right? I was actually born in Plainfield, New Jersey. Um, but my mother left my father at the age of three. And so I've been in Alabama ever since. And so, um, but I was raised in Alabama and I was raised in part of, um, in Mobile, Alabama, the Gulf Coast and part in Selma. What's interesting is that my family, unlike a lot of um, a lot of a lot of families. I know the name of the person who actually got off the slave ship. Um, part of it is because um, she was actually purchased um, uh, by, ironically, my, uh, uh, a great uh, a distant uncle um, um, on the uh, white side of my family. Um, she was my great 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 grandmother. She was purchased 30 minutes away from the house that I grew up in. Um, she was mm. brought, the first place of where my family was brought was actually right outside of Selma and Cahaba in an area called Molet's Bend. You know, at one point that area, one third of cotton production for the entire world came out of the area called the Black Belt. 
that my family, ironically, I sit on this kind of this intersection of as I was doing Ancestry.com that I do around um, a lot of the stories around portions of my family. But here it is. I came up with a working class family at some point where my grandfather, who father was 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 uh, was white and who had literally he owned and and um, he was a father to his children. And, an, and my grandfather was born in 1905. So this is a mixed mm. couple in the deep south in Alabama in the late 1800s. You know, and the one thing wow. that the family was really clear about is that what protected them is that my great grand my great grandfather had land. The fact that he wasn't he was a white man um, and had land, it provided some protection um, for them and some independence. Um, unfortunately, when my grandfather died, the property that his his children he had given his children were was taken by their white cousins, and so my grandfather, mm. latter in age had to move to Mobile, Alabama and start working as a janitor on the shipyard um, and, and start all over. He no longer had um, his inheritance. And so I raised that because all of that I grow out of, you know, I would love to give you this story around, you know, I saw this person one day that was an activist and that is what it inspired me and I was moving forward, but that's not my story. You know, I came into this work um, in many ways, I was called into this work. I was probably in this work before I even recognized um, uh, that I was a part of the work. And what I mean by that, it was never my desire to, um, I'm going to grow up and be an activist. What I thought was I was going to go to school. I was going to become a corporate attorney. I was going to make lots and lots of money. I was going to marry a rich man, have two and a half kids and a dog named Jed, and all was going to be well, right? And so, you know, but there are two things that I think are the kind of foundation and why I share um, the story of my family is that my, the whole trajectory of my life has been in this backdrop of the deep South and where I saw black people experience so much injustice, right? For no other reason, but being who we are. And so part of that, um, and even as a child, it always bothered me, the abuse of power to recognize there were two things. I always tell this story. There were two things um, that I, that, that are like running jokes in my family. The first thing is I was always obsessed with knowing who was the owner, who was in charge. So I would um, drive my grandmother crazy. I would go into Kmart. <laughs> we would be in Kmart or we could be in the mall. And I was, and I called her mama. I was like, mama, who owns the mall? And she's like, baby, I don't like who owns the mall. I don't know who owns the mall. Any store we went into, I want to know who was the owner, who was in charge. <laughs> um, not sure where that came from um, initially, but I've always wanted to know, even as a little girl, we were in Dairy Queen, I want to know who owns Dairy Queen, who is in charge, you know, and then the second thing is I always had um, this visceral reaction of seeing people abuse their sides, use their power to actually um, hurt people. Um, I, I never, it was a, a bully, the bully could be five times my height. Um, and my weight, I was going to take him on. It didn't matter whether he could beat me or not. You know, he was going to have to, he was going to have to give his best shot because I was going to give him everything I got. You know, if I saw him, she, he or she um, um, picking on someone less. So, you know, as I've gotten older and I've thought about kind of those pieces, you know, it seems like I've always had this, this, this natural, um, this natural um, inquis, um, um kind of thought and, and, and was drawn towards this concept of power and the use of power and who had power. And so as I got older, I think activism became a space. And then there was always growing up in the South, you know, something about the railroad tracks were magical. I don't know why they were so magical, but for some reason <laughs> on this side of the railroad tracks, the homes looked a certain kind of way. And on this side, poof, they looked a different kind of way. And I wanted to know what was so magical about the railroad tracks. And so in the backdrop of both of those things, I think they led me on a path of trying to understand how could I impact power? How could I prevent those and disrupt those that use, abuse their power against our community? And how could I literally figure out what was the magic in the railroad tracks, right? And so all of that so kind of- yeah, Marilyn, I'm sorry. So this is a good segue. This is a good segue to the next question, which is yeah. you pursued a position in public office. Was it because of the power that you that you recognized that elected officials had 
A and B in running for office, what was the lesson that you learned? So, so the funny thing is all my answers are going to be probably be the, like, like that's, that shouldn't be the answer. Is the answer. That was not my thought at all. I was actually recruited to run for office. That was not even on my radar. <laughs> that my mentors, I have been doing education. Um, I've been doing education reform advocacy work. And so as a young woman, you know, my first or my first work in the organizing space um, was with is youth leadership development. And so at, in the state of Alabama, the, the education system was just atrocious, um, particularly when you looked at the, the, the inequities around how schools that were in black districts were funded and how schools in white districts were funded. So much so that the state actually was sued and had to be on a consent decree. Um, the, the education budget was so abused and seen as a pork barrel um, for elected officials that they actually had to separate the education budget out of the general budget to prevent the elected officials from um, exploiting and misappropriating and using the money for pet um, port projects, right? And so out of that, it was really in my, my education advocacy that my mentor asked me, who happened to be a state senator at the time, he asked me to run for public office. He asked me to run for the state board of education seat. He was like, you know, um, this you're doing a lot of this work. This seat is coming open. You should run for it. You know, I'm young and full of energy. <laughs> and I'm like, not that, right? <laughs> Did not know what I was starting up for. Um, I literally, I don't know if people on here know, I don't know if the students remember, I guess they're still kind of fed at Kinko's, but Kinko's used to be the spot. That was like the, the, the you really got everything done at Kinko's, right? Girl, First you're dating you yourself, you're dating yourself. <laughs> I know, right? right? Um, and so Kinko's was my campaign office. I made all of my campaign materials out of Kinko's. And my, my actual physical office was a, a, was a Volkswagen Jetta. That's all I had. I had, a, I had a, 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 a moving office, which was my girlfriend's car, because her car was in better shape than my car. And we had Kinko's. And as a result, I ran for state board of ed education, which made, I, I ran statewide um, in 20 counties. Um, in the district that it covered. And so ironically, um, I'm saying that because I, ironically, it was at the end of me, um, I had gone to meet with one of the most powerful people in the state of Alabama and left out, this is a whole nother story, left out with a check expecting it to be a $100 donation check and it wound up being $10,000 and it almost scared me to death and I didn't understand what happened. Went to my mentor to find out that in fact, I was leading in the polls, that I was, um, I was wow. reading the polls and it was at that moment I'm talking to my mentor and I, and he said, you know what, you might actually win, you might win this thing. And I'm looking at him and I said, wasn't I supposed to win? He was like, well, yeah, I mean, and I realized at that moment that actually he didn't think that I had a chance to win all of that time. <laughs> I was running because the other candidate was the, the he was over the education budget and the, the person who was sitting in that seat had went against some major um, policy pieces that he desired. So I literally was, I was the threatened candidate. I, he didn't think that I could win for real. So I was like, wait a minute, but I thought I was supposed to win. So anyway, that, that, that's part of the reason why I ran. Um, I ran a grassroots campaign um, I ran against, I was the most unelectable candidate that one, particularly in the time where traditional candidates around electability, one, I was a single mother. I was 28 years old. I was a young person who had never run for public office before. For the most part, I was broke. I had 15,000, I was making, I was working a job that I made $15,000 a year. I was broke, right? Um, I, had, I had none of the credentials um, that my opponent had who had been a 12 year incumbent. Um, and so in spite of it, and then I remember headlines. I remember one of the headlines in the Montgomery advertiser saying youth versus experience. And so for that seat, the fact that I was a young person, it wasn't as welcoming. And even now I think it's hard for young people to run and be taken seriously. But back then it was extremely challenging for people to see um, um, young people literally run for office, particularly a statewide office, and you ain't even 30 yet. That was like unheard. Right, right. In addition to that, mm -hmm. I literally had two strand twists. I was, I had the same hairstyle that Stacey Abrams had as well, <laughs> right? And that may not be a big deal now. And so Marilyn, I see you are rocking the natural out, but let me tell you, <laughs> right, in 1998, <laughs> in the state of Alabama, 
a black woman wearing natural hair. I I cannot tell you how many places I would go to and the older women pull me to the side, like, baby, why don't you get a perm? <laughs> like, like it was just, you know, the whole, so I was all of those things that were outside of the box of what a traditional candidate should look like. Um, that and yet and yet you know um it was the the campaign was uh so tight that it took them seven days to call the race and so which actually led to another you know led to me doing a, a voter work really understanding voter suppression um but yeah so when i ran for office it was kind of a recruitment um it was literally in my mind it was to lift up i thought i was supposed to win i did think that but it was to actually create this agenda that I had been working on and advocating, you know, to really be able to push that. It wasn't because I was even thinking around, I want to be in public office. It was literally being driven by the mission that I wanted to advance. So what was the lesson that you learned from that experience? Whew. So there's a couple of lessons I learned. <laughs> um, the, the first okay. lesson, the first, this is the first time that in, you know, in my life in the African-American community, what, what, and I, and I know you can attest to this as well, Marilyn, that, you know, racism is such a predominant factor, what we deal with that oftentimes it is, you know, there's like nothing that we do that we don't really understand on some level, the impact and the influence of racism, you know, and so I was aware of that. What I realized that I had been very naive around was sexism and sexism even in my own community. And so um, mm -hmm. I grossly underestimated that I knew it, but in many ways I, did, I thought it wasn't as bad as sex, as racism, right? Until as a young woman, um, when I would go around to churches to speak, they would deny me the opportunity to be able to come to the church. Um, they also, in one instance, which was a really painful instance, um, that has happened to me actually several times, including in 2018. That's another story. Um, I was, because I was, I was literally told, because I was a woman, I was unable to speak in the diocese, that my male counterpart could speak from the diocese because he was a man, and I had to speak from the floor. And so mm. I, that was, um, that was eye-opening for me around how um, oppression finds its way, it weighs in, 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 in many different corners and how sexism was as much a driver and as much a barrier and as much of an issue for us to pull down as racism. And throughout that process, there were, there were, there are many things that I experienced. Um, like I said, I could, I couldn't get past my hair. Like I was in conversations instead of, I couldn't even get past my hair. For some reason, my opponent could be bald headed. He could have a whole hole up here. Nobody cared. For some reason, my hair mattered, right? Some reason, what kind of right. lips I mattered, right? Uh, uh, mattered. The way that I, where I sat, who I spoke to first, I, there was a different kind of standard and expectation on me as a woman and as a young woman than on my male counterpart. And so that was one of the lessons I learned. The second lesson I learned was um, around um, organizing. That from that day to this day, what I know is that he who organizes, out organizes, <laughs> is who he who has a he or she who has the advantage of winning. And that what I Absolutely. recognized that morning that in that in that campaign, that although I was not the favorite candidate, although I was all those things I shared with you all, that by traditional standards made me not the most electable. Um, what I had is I had organization that I was an organizer. And as a result, the way that I worked hard, you know, um, I gained ground was through organizing. So it's always that campaign has always convinced me of the power of organizing. That organized power is realized power. And the third and the final thing is because of what I experienced, um, I, that is when I was slapped right in the face around voter suppression. That I knew voter suppression, I knew of voter suppression in the 1960s. You know, I knew that there were some isolated incidents. What I did not know is just how pervasive um, voter suppression was um, and still maintained to be, may, uh, still maintained, uh, was, that system was still being maintained, um, particularly in, in Southern politics or even in politics that black people um, are engaged in the short, story around that is it's seven days it took to call the election on the seventh day when the election was called um at the time i was down by 117 votes i think it wound up being a, a close to 200 votes 
on, on which mm-hmm. the difference between myself and my opponent, they certified the race on the seventh day, you certify the election. So all the races So on the race was certified at 12 o'clock. At 12.05, my mentor called me, Senator Sanders said, brace yourself, the chair of the Democratic Party is about to give you a call. I, at 12 o'clock, I mean, when I knew that my opponent before they certified it, had won, I called him, I congratulated him, I conceded, I was fine. I was like, I did a good run, that was a good first out, and, and went on about my business. However, you know, I get this phone call at 12.05 that the race had been certified at 12 and the phone call went something like this. Latasha, I'm so sorry to make this phone, I make this call to you, but the sheriff of Wilcox County, which is a county that I had carried that happens to be located in the black belt where I was strong. Um, the sheriff of Wilcox County just found 800 ballots that he had 800 votes that he had placed in the safe that he forgot that he put in the safe. And so he just called us to let us know that he had these 800 ballots. Well, in my naivety, I mean, that's an easy, that's an easy solution. You got the 800 ballots, right. you know they're valid. He said he put them in the safe. They've been in the safe place. We, let's count the ballots. That might give him an opportunity. And, and he told me, his name was Giles Perkins. He was a, the head of the Democratic Party. He said, I'm sorry, you know, but the race has been certified. I was like, well, what does that mean? Right. That means the race is certified. We can't count those votes. And so I remember feeling in that moment so powerless that here it was that someone else had made a determination, right, of essentially abusing the process. And his candidate, in fact, won. He was never held accountable or no one connected to that was held accountable. And so at that moment in 1998, I realized how insidious, how voter suppression was a threat to democracy. And that's literally when I started my journey. What we did in 2018, which is actually years later, decades later, like was literally informed by my experience in in 1998. Wow. So I know that we are a little pressed for time. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Um, Because I'm dying to understand, how did you get from Alabama to Atlanta to the national stage? Was it was it uh, Doug Jones that took you to the national stage or were you already there before Doug Jones? So we want to ask that question. And then I also want to get to to win with black women, too. Okay, so let's if you want to wrap into the answer, I'll be. Okay, I'll try to be brief because I know we want to open up for, for questions. They're actually one and the same. So that's a great, great question. They're actually one and the same. So um, essentially, I, I had always, my work has always been regional work. You know, I, I've always had this belief that w- how, as goes the South goes the nation. And so over a number of years, I've been doing, over the last 27 years, I've been doing work in Alabama and Al- Mississippi and Tennessee and, you know, and all, all throughout the South outside of Black Voters Matter. This is before we founded Black Voters Matter. And so while uh-huh. I was doing work and known for work because I was a native of Alabama, I was also in some national spaces. One of those spaces that actually created a national platform for me to be able to connect with other people nationally um, and other campaign learning was the Black Women's Roundtable. And so as a young woman, Uh I actually entered that um, as a, um, what was it called? Black Youth Vote. So my first foray into this kind of national space, not the spotlight, spotlight. So because so let me distinguish their space and their spotlight. Mm-hmm. So to be in the space of work <laughs> um, was Black Women's Roundtable, but it actually was started with Black Youth Vote. I was a, a one of the initial advisors for Black Youth Vote with Melanie Campbell that is currently um, ran the CEO, Melanie Campbell, brought me in. And so had it not been for Melanie, like many of those national conversations and being able to meet the other young people that were doing work in NAACP National and those other organizations, that was the vehicle. Um, because the South is very isolated and a lot of my work was local um, and regional. And so that that created the space over the last 20 years to really be able to be in in, in national spaces. But only the people who were in that space kind of knew me in that way. What actually kind of propelled us to national spotlight was the work that we did in, in Black Voters Matter. You know, that in the last few years that people in philanthropy nationally kind of knew me and people in the um, in the movement space. But outside of that, that was kind of, you know, that was kind of the universe of actually kind of knew of my work. You know, what the J- Doug Jones race did in Alabama, it did it catapult, it catapulted um, both myself and Cliff and Black Voters Matter because one, it had national, that race had national implications and it was such a mm-hmm. different Right. It was 
it was the flip of all flips. Like to flip Alabama is no um, easy feat. And so that was no. a, a race that actually kind of put us on the map um, in many ways, at least in the national kind of um, media sphere in many ways. And, and, and then of course, Georgia has actually helped amplify and accelerated that. But in many ways, I've been in national conversations or in organizing circles, but in terms of the spotlight, it was the, 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 the Doug Jones race was literally kind of the race that actually amplified our work for people to start asking, what does Black voters matter? And who is this Latasha Brown and Cliff Albright? That was the, the route. Well, I will say this. I remember coming out of retirement in that in, after the 2016 election cycle, I went into retirement, but it was the Doug Jones race that refocused me um, on national politics, especially at, at Alabama. And I remember texting our girlfriend, Dewana Thompson, like, what's going on? We're going to win. How's it going? How's it looking? Between Dewana and um, Aaron Harris, they, they kept me informed of what was going on, on the ground. But that was also when I first heard of this girl, Latasha Brown, who's a political strategist. And I'm saying to myself, I don't know her. How is it that I don't know her? I know everybody. But I, I, I at first introduced you there. But it was through the work of Jotaka Edy, who started the Win Rock, Win with Black Women mm -hmm. movement that I got to actually hear and be part of those Sunday meetings that you were part of as well. So I wanna to talk to you, oh, I wanna ask you, what was it like, one, to be part of the process, to have a seat at the table and a seat at the table with people of power who um, traditionally uh, don't create spaces for black people or for women, right? Um, but you all were able to, cause those of you who had the liberty to have these meetings directly, whereas other of us who were moonlighting as, as mm -hmm. activists, you had conversations with people Bye. of power, and I won't say who, I'll let you say if you want to, but you were able to advocate for, not even advocate, you demanded, mm -hmm. you demanded that we have a woman on the ballot, but not only did you demand that, once we received it, you also went into action to ensure that the community was community. But I want you to talk about that experience. Talk about, again, my girl from Mobile, my best friend from Mobile, Alabama, who is now having conversations with people at the highest level of this business and demanding a seat at the table for a woman and a woman of color in particular. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, and thank you for sharing. You know, I do a shout out to Joteka Edie. And, you know, the beauty about Win With Black Women is that it was organic. It was Black women coming together, using our power, using our network, using our skills. Um, to, to, to use our collective power. And so I think that was, I think that in itself is instructive. I think that that's a lot of, it even gave space. Um, it gave a space for us to kind of work together and get to know each other and even expand our network. You know, but I, you know, I, I would say that what was interesting is, you know, after 20 years of, of at some point, when you're waiting to get the invitation to the dinner and the invitation doesn't come, you decide that I'm just going to fix my own dinner. Right. And somebody going to need this food that I got. Right. <laughs> so uh, what right. we do is that and and and, and the, the point being is that it was no longer acceptable to me that I am glad that the world has discovered um, black women. I am very deeply honored and humbled by, you know, the opportunity, the kind of uh, media attention that I've been able to receive and platforms that I've been able to receive. I'm very, very grateful for that. But I am not new to this. I am true to this. I've been doing this work for 27 years. Now, for some reason, it takes them over two decades to find Black women, but I've been here all along, right? <laughs> uh, and so I, I'm, I'm saying that, that at some point, you know, we had to change our strategy too. At some point, you know, this 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 strategy and this hope that, you know, if we did the work, you would be rewarded. It, it's so funny. It reminds me of, um, this is going to seem like one off, but I promise you this was instructive to me. When I was a, um, I was a cheerleader and in high school um, and, you know, now the circumstances were really challenging in terms of, you know, how I was a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader. There were 13 cheerleaders that were um, in a school that was 65% black. Um, of the 13 cheerleaders, all of the cheerleaders were white. And there was one black cheerleader, it was myself, um, who had tried out. There were over 113 girls that had tried out. 
um, all of the white girls that tried out for cheerleading made it and all the 113, the 100 and 100 black girls that tried out did not make it. Right. And so um, I, in that process, the reason why I rate, brought that up is I remember I was the one cheerleader that had never missed a game. Now, part of it is because my boyfriend was a star basketball player and I was not going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I did not miss. I prided myself that I had made every single <laughs> game in the season, um, and I was the only one. And I remember on the day where we were getting awards, I was so convinced that I was going to get an award because, in few, you know, normally that's acknowledged, and it was never acknowledged. They hadn't even thought about it. Even when I asked later, it was like, oh, we didn't even think about that. It was insignificant, and so I remember. Mm-hmm. It's funny because that moment. And that experience actually kind of informed, believe it or not, even this Kamala moment, that I can wait till they can figure it out or I can help them get it much quicker, right? And part of doing that was this this notion, this idea of that I am not only a worker, I'm a strategist. And at the bottom line is when I do work, it's not just about my vote. I'm good for a couple of thousand votes just on GP. And when I'm really good, I might get I might get you a couple of million. Right. And so in that, that it was an opportunity that not just about what I wanted, but how could I leverage my power as a black operative, as an organizer, as a thought leader, as a strategist. And so I, along with um, other sisters, decided that we would actually broach that conversation that was no longer acceptable, that black women would be expected to deliver. Yet we would get nothing in return, you know, that it was no longer acceptable for us to kind of move forward in this space where oftentimes black women are expected to be the workhorse, right? But we don't see ourselves represented in the highest offices. And so part of what I think part of that experience, what it felt like, Like it felt like I was operating in my power. It wasn't so much that they invited us to the table. We created the circumstances that that they had that there had to be a table that was set. Um, And and we made you know, we made a proposition. Our proposition is if you can do this on your own, go forth. And I was very clear my my position, you know, Part of this was strategy. Part of this was my poker face because the truth of the matter is, you know, I was really clear. <laughs> I mean, part of it was I was like, you know, the truth of the matter is I can live with Trump. I'm from Alabama. I live with Trump every day. Now, y'all ain't the question is <laughs> you live with Trump, right? Because you ain't used to Trump, but I live with Trump. I have my entire life. I've grown up with Trump. Now, the truth of the matter, that was a little poker face because I swear I couldn't live with that man anymore. Right. But but at the end of the day. <laughs> I had to really recognize and put it on the table. The question is, can you? And if you are comfortable with that, then go ahead and move forward how you're going forward. But if you want me to work and if you want some of and all and there were several of us, if you want us to work passionately for you, if you deliver to us, we will deliver to you. And we made good on our delivery. I have never I've worked. I am a hard worker. And I worked on over 48 campaigns. I have, Marilyn, I ain't never worked this hard in my life. <laughs> this Girl, last me I, I, have, <laughs> I have never worked this hard. I was like, there's no sleep for the weary. My body don't even know how to go to sleep now from that space. My, my, my point though, you know, in that is that part of the, the, what I wanted to raise was that we literally had to use power that we had to actually operate. What my power is, is literally being able to know that I, I galvanize, um, that I'm a strategist, that I galvanize hundreds, thousands, millions of votes. And so instead of just allowing, waiting on, like I was a cheerleader, learning from that, waiting on, okay, I did the work, they're gonna recognize I did the work and I'm gonna get on the award. I'm not even gonna wait on that anymore. I'm gonna tell you, listen, this is what I did. This is what the expectation is. This is what I'm willing to do, right? If you're able to deliver your part, but we're not going to move forward. And then in our community, we're not, we're constantly expected to deliver and you're not delivering for us on the front end. Well, I I appreciate the work that you all did. Um, We all, I think I'm still recovering from all the, from the Sunday calls and the activities that, that, that came after them. But I want to pivot because we're going to take questions from the audience. So if anyone has questions, please use the Q&A feature to um, put your questions up and I'll read them. But while we wait on audience questions, um, Natasha, I want to ask, because I'd be remiss if I didn't do this. Like people want to know, how did you guys win in Georgia? And can that be replicated? And and, and I want to give a shout out to all of the women who were part of 
um, the, the Georgia efforts, and you know more in a person than I do, um, the Tamika Mallory's, I saw her traveling around the state, um, Dewana Thompson traveling around the state. Um, here in New Jersey, our girl, St Stephanie Dixon was down in Atlanta, or well, in, in uh, she was in Savannah. Um, I know there was Tamika Atkins, there was Helen Butler. Of, of course, you know, everyone knows uh, the work of, of Stacey Abrams. One, I want you to talk about the people who came together, men and women, um, who you may know more intimately than, we, than I do, but also talk about what you did and can that be replicated in other places? Thank you. I also, you know, I, I, uh, just a quick shout out, just some people that came to my mind too is Nse Ufad, who runs the New Georgia Project, Deborah Scott that runs Georgia Stand Up. And listen, you know, the sisters, let me be clear now, sisters were out there doing that thing, but there were some brothers who were also holding the line and working hard. One of them is my partner, Cliff Albright, who is co-founder and executive director, and Mondale Robinson, um, John Taylor, who works in labor. And so this was a collective effort. You know, it is, that is a whole kind of discussion on itself in terms of the blueprint of what we did. But I do want to just pull out a couple of distinctions around what made this one really different. You know, um, in terms of the policy, because I know this is the Eagleton Institute of Politics, you know, in terms of the structure on how you get the vote out, that doesn't change much, right? Like, you know, doing the phone, calls to text messaging that's like that's like retail politics like that just works right but the the challenge and i think even sometimes the the party particularly i think both parties but the democratic party in particular since i'm more intimately um knowledgeable of the of of, of um kind of the workings of the Democratic Party have like literally you know kind of relied on the retail politics part of the model around you know um, the, 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 the using the, the data, doing the voter contact, that kind of thing. And then there's this assumption that if you make X amount of voter contacts and that's going to win the race, how has that worked out for us? Right. That that in itself right. you know, it has not been the issue. So what was the, dis the difference? What were the distinctions? I think that there were a couple of distinctions. I particularly, I'll lift up our work, but what I saw happening in Georgia, there were a couple of things. One, I think all, all the time that I think that we shifted kind of the focal point that oftentimes in elections, which is why we started Black Voters Matter, oftentimes in elections, the focal point is either on the candidate having this charismatic candidate. It's almost like the, the snow, snow white or the Cinderella. You got to have the Prince Charming on a horse that's going to come and save us all. Right. And so you need the perfect <laughs> candidate. You know, or the, the political party has such an interest that it becomes centered around our power. And both of those are frames that I'm not saying that they weren't used in this context, but if we had relied on those two things, we would be looking at a very different political landscape, right? And so for us, what our distinction, what we did is we shifted the pot, we shifted the focal point. The focal point, instead of it being on a candidate, on this charismatic, amazing candidate that was gonna save us all, or even rooted in this notion of like, let's save the party because this is the, the party is the only thing that we have for us. We shifted our focal point to being around people and their power, their vulnerability, but they had the power. We ran a campaign that was centered around what my grandmother used to say, speaking life instead of speaking death. So instead of organizing folks saying, if you don't get folk, Trump is going to send us back to something, something like, like moving a fear-based campaign. We did a hope-based right. campaign that basically centered actually the candidate, I mean, centered the voter, not the candidate, not even the political party. Um, a, a case in point of, of the evidence of that is in the state of Georgia, in this last election cycle, um, President Biden received more votes than President Obama. Now, do y'all think we like President, we more excited about President Biden than President Obama? <laughs> Exactly. Right. My point. Right. And so part of what structural racism does is it actually help, it marginalizes and it oversimplifies the sophistication of black voters, that there's this notion that you have to have an Obama type candidate, that that's what's going to drive the vote. We have defied that and shown that that's not the case. The same thing in Alabama. We weren't excited about Doug Jones, right? Like nobody knew Doug Jones, really, right? That the, the, that it wasn't about Doug Jones. That is a very limited perspective that came from a group of consultants who are not experts in our community. What we knew is that we needed a message that would move people where they could actually see a sense of their own power and that would drive them would be something different. That the driver for them is for them to feel a sense 
sense of power and their agency, and they would operate out of that. And every time we've used that frame, every time we've organized around that, that has made the difference. The second thing is that we showed up in a way that people did not feel that oftentimes in a political um, when we're doing political campaigns, as you all know, it's very episodic. It's very cyclical um, in nature. And so it usually, you know, there is there's this very abusive, exploitive way that we've seen political parties and candidates deal with black voters. It is the last three weeks before the campaign when they desperate is to round the Negroes up, throw a, a, a couple of dollars, have people to come to your door that you don't even know, knocking on your door, telling you to vote. And, and that in itself... Um, it, um, while it will have some impact around letting folks get a turnout, it does not have the kind of, it will not drive the kind of impact that we saw what it took for the Doug Jones race or even in the presidential race or even in the Georgia race. And so for us, what we do is we do work we call 365 days out of the year. Really what you saw happen in Georgia that in many of those places that delivered in the presidential and the Senate race were also places that we had invested and worked in in local elections. That over the last four years, we've been supporting city council races, um, county commission races that nobody has heard outside of those communities. Because when you show up for communities in terms of how they determine and need power and help to build the infrastructure and the ecosystem, when we have these other races, you can activate them. It's much easier to activate them. Um, and so that was another thing that we did, that the way that we showed up was not in a way that was explorative. It was literally centered in what we all learn in poli sci 101, but for some reason we never follow. And that is all politics are local. So our entry point in these communities was actually starting with local. And the third and the final thing is that, you know, part of the challenge is that there's always a lack of investment on the ground. You know, that there were millions and there was a half a mil billion dollars that was spent on the Georgia race alone. A lot of that, those resources are usually directed to TV, quite frankly, because there's a class of consultants um, that have a vested interest in those resources going to TV. We did the act is the mm -hmm. absolute opposite. What we felt is that the way that we can actually mobilize communities, one, put money on the ground to credible messengers, put money on the ground to organizations that are not that are embedded in indigenous organizations that are not going anywhere and literally be able to use our resources instead of literally spending millions of dollars on television ads. What how can we spend resources in a way that would be supportive to the needs of the community as they need it now? And so in doing so, what we did is that we would show up in ways that wasn't even connected to the vote. For example, during the uprising, we created a um, uh, we created a fund. We created a, a liberation fund that that we were able to get people out of jail who participated in the George Floyd uprising and over 20 funds we contributed resources for. We actually supported when COVID, we created a COVID-19 fund that communities that were actually struggling with food, were struggling with testing, struggling with PPE, that we actually provided millions of dollars to organizations to be able to support that. Not attached to, we just come in because we want your vote, but that we actually created created and shifted the dynamic that people felt that when we showed up is because they mattered, not necessarily that they're right. voting right over them. And then the last thing that we did, you know, one of the fun things that I think was a highlight of our, we had a collard green caucus, you know, where we bought all of the collard greens in the state of Georgia from black voters. I mean, from black farmers, I mean, every single bunch. Right. Um, and we're able to distribute them. Um, and as uh, collard greens and black eyed peas and cornbread as part of a tradition in the black community around having those items in your kitchen. And so what we did between October and between October and December, we were able to actually provide food for over 20,000 families, um, groceries throughout um, a rural Georgia that had been hit hard with COVID-19. It wasn't a condition whether they voted or not. We didn't even ask them, you know, um, necessarily that you got to vote to get this. We would encourage and give them information around voting, but it was important for us to show up in a way that says, we see you, we care about you beyond the vote, that what is important to you is you and your well-being and that you have power and that that in itself, I think, created a, a, a landscape for us to be conceived, uh, perceived as um, trusted messengers because people knew that they were not, they were more than a vote for us, that their humanity mattered to us, and that voting was just another um, uh, opportunity for us to use our power and express our agency. So Latasha, I know we have a few minutes left, but I want us to take a few questions from, from the audience. And one in particular is from Mario. Mario is a student and he wants to know how can they, how can students build coalitions on campus to, to, to promote their agenda 
um, on campus of, 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 around issues that are, are pertinent to them. So can we can we can we take what you did on a macro level and apply it to a micro level at the university, so that when Mario goes back to school, whether it's in a few weeks or in the fall, and they want to uh, you know mobilize or mobilize and organize around issues, how best can he and his friends um, do that? Mara, thank you for that question. You are actually already halfway there. <laughs> um, you made a decision, <laughs> something that you want to do. You know, I, we have to demystify this process that we have to be perfect before we start something. You know, if, if um, our organization has grown um, exponentially, part of it is because our leadership has been flexible enough that there are a couple of things that I think that we, that we did right. I think the first thing was that we had a clear vision. We did not know all the details of, of what we needed to do um, initially, but we had a clear vision of what exactly we wanted to contribute to. And so I think there are three things to do just quickly because uh, so we can get other questions. But the first thing is going back to my first initial piece that you need to have a vision around what it is that you think that you want to, you and the students and the group that you're um, engaged in, what part of the work do you want to help with? And have and get clarity around not just not in the how, but in the what. What is the ultimate vision? What is it the output? What is it that you're trying to shift? The second thing is um, this is going to seem counterintuitive because oftentimes with organizations, you know, they think like I've got the idea now. I just want people to believe. I just want to enfold them in the idea. We did the opposite. You know, we had an idea, we had a vision, but the first thing that we did, the first six months after the Doug Jones race. All we did is travel around, I, I tease them all the time, in cheap rental cars um, around the back roads of seven states in the South, and we listened, that we took the time. I cannot stress enough that if you take the time to listen to the people that you want to serve, they will tell you exactly what you need to be doing. And oftentimes organizations will have a preconceived idea of what they need to do. And they're trying to force that upon folks and then tell them, this is what you need done, right? Instead, so the second thing I would say is get your vision. Second thing is to invest time in listening to the constituency group or whoever it is. Yeah. So get a group of students on campus that to, st to, to talk with, that you all listen to each other around what is your collective vision, what it is that you would like to achieve. And the third thing is, you know, I think it's, it's, it's getting at least some kind of mentorship. You know, I believe in mentorship. I am 50 years old and I, got, I have mentors, right? And I will be an 80 year old with mentors. I believe in mentorship, that there are some mistakes that you don't have to make on your own because there are other, there's nothing new under the sun. Black voters matter may be a right. different iteration, but everything we've done, people have done this before. And so I would just suggest right. that you find you some mentors that can actually help support you through this process as well. Now, now, Darren McCauley had a question, and I think this is relevant because during the campaign, we saw um, the impact on COVID on traditional grassroots organizing. And for the most part, um, especially here in the North, the Northeast in particular, in Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, and the Northeast area, we shut it down. We didn't do any door knocking. We didn't, we just did phone calls and used social media. Um, and you may have, you may, I'm not, I'm not sure if you gave any thought to this, but there was a point in the campaign when that was the strategy, right? But they had to pivot back to the traditional door knocking in a safe environment, right? So I want to, I want to pose a question to you and, and Darren raised this, how going forward, because we, I, I foresee COVID being here for the next year, for next fall elections, we're going to have to contend with COVID, right? So how can candidates who are gonna run in, in June for in New Jersey in particular or, or in November, how would you recommend that they start to organize their campaigns in this COVID environment so that we can we can engage with with the voters in a safe environment like you all did um, down south? So thank you. You know, the, the interesting thing is that we were uh, we were up south, too. We were in Pennsylvania and we worked, <laughs> we worked very, very deeply in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And so I'm, I'm very familiar and Michigan. And it was challenging. Um, but also, even though our governors didn't have any sense down south in Georgia, places like that, but because we cared about the livelihood, we actually we actually quarantined as well, that we did not hit the streets until um, June, and that was very, um, and it was light touches. We never went to full capacity on how we organize out um, in, in the way that we had envisioned before. 
our entire operation had to be adjusted to the new reality around COVID-19. And so the first six months where we had planned on being out in the streets, we had to literally be able to do a couple of things. We had to pivot and use um, the, I did and increase and expand our digital footprint. You know, most of the time, our digital space, we saw that as like the extra. That was kind of like the extra in the organizing. It became the core meat of our organizing. And so what we had to do is we did virtual town halls in all of our, our communities. We had to do virtual trainings. We had, like everybody else, you know, I called myself at the end of like, I think month two, I was like, I think I'm a Zumbi. I was Zoomed out, but this was the platform that was safest. <laughs> Um, and we didn't want because at, at some point, even in Georgia, we did not get we did not go out initially at all, even though there were some other organizations that um, many of us were shut down because it was like, you know, if you remember, everybody was trying to act right at first. Right. Right. At least on some level. Right. Um, uh, because it was so devastating to our community in April of last year, 80 percent of all covid hospitalizations were African-Americans in the state of Georgia and were only 30% of the population. So it was ravaging our community. And so being good stewards and, and putting our people first, we didn't we actually didn't go on the streets at all. Um, what we did is we moved all of our work to digital campaigning. Um, the one advantage that we had is that the pre previous years, as I said, our model is building capacity of grassroots groups. And so we already had a network and an ecosystem of building a trust so we could actually get a lot of the campaigns, those campaigns that people are parachuting in, they don't know folks, they're coming in and they're going door to door. We knew people because we were in working with organizations that were embedded in, in, in communities. And so if we had an event, we could have a virtual event because we were already plugging in to existing networks because those are networks we had been cultivating and working over the last three, um, three or four years, last four years. And so as a result, we would actually have town halls, virtual town halls, that some we would have from 300 to 1,000 people. Now, the interesting thing is if we had a physical town hall, we never would normally have a 1,000 people, right? And so in many ways, in a very interesting way, our pivot, you know, while we lost the, 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 um, um, the human to human touch in some ways, particularly, um, and, and had to adjust that, we were able to get our message out actually wider by using the digital space and being very creative and using the digital space. The second piece is really being able to tap into existing infrastructure of relationships so that we could actually get information out quicker. Um, and then the, almost like we were we were like the voting underground railroad, like we call a friend and knew a friend, they had a friend, and then we would like build out kind of this ecosystem. And then the last thing I'll say kind of related to that is that part of the way that we had to organize and messaging was really important. Um, we had to really organize really strongly around narrative shift and messaging and be able to use social media in ways that we had never used before. We even had an animated cartoon. We had to do creative things that pushed us out of our comfort zone to be able to get deliver the message in a different medium that was quite frankly kind of in many ways were new to us the medium itself wasn't new but to use it in that expanded way was new and so I would just say to you that part of what the candidates have to do is the candidates are going to have to build out their digital footprint that at the end of the day even an election is not worth putting people's lives at risk you know and then we did creative things that as we went out we did caravans we would do these big caravans that we wouldn't engage people people would be in their car Right. And we would do like these mm -hmm. car parades and we would do it with car shows so that people would actually sit outside. They would see us. We had QR codes on the side of our cars or side of the bus so that folks didn't have to touch us. All they had to do is take a picture of hold their phone up on the QR code and they'll get their voter registration form right there. They would get information on their wow. voting right there. And so we had to be creative using those digital tools to be able to engage people. Wow, that's awesome. Well, one last question. So most states are now moving toward from, from the election to redistricting and gerrymandering has been an issue in our community for years, for decades. Um, uh, Catherine Hat Hatkaskas from UC Davis posed this question. How do we pivot, really pivot from the, 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 the tools we use to organize, to turn out the vote, to preparing for um, redistricting and ensuring that we maintain, um, especially those districts that are um, majority minority or have a, mon a minority presence um, as we go forward with redistricting and, 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 and address voter suppression at the same time. 
That's an excellent question. You know, part of the reason why we built our organization not on an election model, there are organizations that they're just election organizations. That's not who we are. We're a power building group. Our goal was always our organization, actually a Black Voters Matter Fund, which is our C4, but our C3 is Black Voters Matter Capacity Builder Institute. We were very intentional about building an organization that could build up capacity groups, capacity of groups to do works precisely for that reason. That many of the organizations that we work with, that we had decided that we wouldn't just work with organizations that did voter work, but that we would work with organizations that did education reform, work, some of the groups that we're doing, we're doing a prison, prison abolishment work, some of the groups that we work with with civic engagement groups, some of them with churches, but that part of what we would do is invest in the ecosystem. As a result, last year, we actually invested over $10 million and almost 800 Black-led grassroots groups to help them build their capacity where we actually cut checks to them, right? Um, for them to build their capacity so that they could be stronger so that literally they could always pivot, that the whole idea is that the infrastructure wouldn't just be there for a candidate or for a campaign, but that you would have that existing infrastructure that those same folks, that when there was an issue that came up about police brutality, they could respond collectively. That when an issue came up around yep. gerrymandering, they could respond um, um, automatically. And so our entire model was actually created with that in mind, that we would not be an organization that would just be the round the Negroes up, that it would be around elections, that we would be an organization that our focus would be on building power. And our, our methodology in terms of doing that would be that we would actually build out infrastructure of grassroots groups and literally be able to connect that ecosystem so that as things came that were... Um, of, 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 of importance and interest to our community that people could collectively respond from wherever their institution and that they could work collectively together on moving an agenda almost as like a coordinated campaign. Awesome, that's awesome. Well, well, Latasha, I want to thank you for extending your time today to, to take questions and to just share your, your, your knowledge with the community. Um, on behalf of the Gabaccini um, civic engagement series at Eagleton. Thank you so much for, for participating today and just sharing your wealth of knowledge. We hope you will come to your home state of New Jersey um, <laughs> as we have a gubernatorial election this year. So we welcome you. I know Drew, one of the people who made a comment in the, in the Q&A, uh, we welcome you in New Jersey. So please, um, when the time is appropriate, come to Jersey. Um, but uh, as we close, I just want to take this moment to thank the Gambaccini family and friends for cont continuing to support the civic engagement series at Eagleton. I also wanna thank Access Week, the Paul Robeson Cultural Center and the Center for Social Justice Education. And lastly, the LGBT communities for co-sponsoring co today's program. Latasha, thank you again. And I look forward to meeting you in person soon. That's right, especially since we're best friends now. So thank you, Mary. Absolutely. <laughs> You're welcome. And thank you thank to you. all of the students and people who have tuned in. You know, the, the last thing that I just want to offer, if nobody remembers anything I said, is that this work is really not about um, this work isn't about democracy. Democracy is a means to an end. This work is literally about the love and advancement of humanity. And democracy is a vehicle to get us there. So I'm hoping that as we're doing our work, as you all are continuing to move forward, that we literally keep what is important front and center. And that is the safety, the well-being, and the advancement of humanity. So thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, my sister. Thank you.